Okay. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, my thanks to um, Mitch and Japanese Tools for sponsoring this and to all of you for uh, tuning in. And I hope we we do get some uh, questions and maybe get a discussion going. You know, I I will probably I'll try to cover uh, really a wide range of subjects tonight. Obviously, boat building, but also talk a bit about apprenticeship, Japanese apprenticeship, um, and you know the the foundations of my research in Japan, which now goes back uh, 32 years. I've been to Japan 25 times since 1990, and. Uh, I have apprenticed with nine boat builders from throughout Japan, um, and I am the sole apprentice for seven of those nine teachers. So sadly, all my teachers were in their 70s and 80s when I worked with them, and so this they are, they really represent the last generation of traditional boat builders in Japan. And my work now is pivoting really away from research uh, to try to teach. And my ultimate ambition is to try to start a boat building school in Japan to try to carry on this craft. Uh, this opening slide is a map of my apprenticeships and major boat building projects I've done for museums, uh, in other institutions and festivals in Japan. Um, if you, you can see my cursor, we can use that like a pointer. My, my show is essentially going to run chronologically through my apprenticeships um, and hopefully like I say cover as many topics as I possibly can so just to geographically set the stage my first apprenticeship was out here on Sato Island in the Sea of Japan second and third apprenticeships here in Tokyo Bay then up to the far north to Aomori down to the furthest south southern part of Japan in Okinawa then back up, I apprenticed with uh, one of the last boat builders along this coastline that was um, devastated by the tsunami in 2011. I felt it was important to document that tradition of boat building because of the enormous loss of material culture by the, created by the disaster. So that was my fifth apprenticeship. And then uh, I went and built my first river boat uh, here, right in the geographic center of Japan in Gifu, um, the Cormorant Fishing Boat, which is an iconic craft in Japan. Uh, and then my most recent trip to Japan before the pandemic broke out a few months before, late 2019, I apprenticed with another river boat builder here in Niigata. And then over here to Himi in Toyama, to build a sea boat that that featured a very interesting construction style seen here on the Sea of Japan that I had never never seen built before. So that's the that's the lay of the land, and we'll get right to it. So that first apprenticeship in in 1990 on my first trip to Japan, um, I had a magazine photograph that improbably showed a woman in a barrel. Uh, at sea fishing and the caption said Sato Island and so I went there uh, and I had no idea what I would find but um, the very first photograph I took my very first morning on the island was this down at the local harbor and these are tub boats tarai bune which means tub boat and they are fishing boats traditional fishing boats on Sato Island um, these are the conventional uh, fishing boats behind them um, there's only there's really only these two style of fishing boats on the whole island. And at the time I visited in 1990, there were two people still building these boats. Um, here's a man fishing. Uh, he's steadying the boat with his paddle. He's using a wooden box with a glass bottom to see uh, his catch. And then he has a selection of long bamboo spears. Um, this is to grab a shellfish. This is to grab abalone and this uh, right angle um, uh, device is to grab seaweed to harvest kelp. And so um, he just reaches behind him, grabs, a, grabs the appropriate spear and then gathers, gathers uh, the catch. 
and gathering shellfish and gathering seaweed like this is a very very common fishing practice in inshore japan in fact there's there's a verb for it isonegi which uh, is best translated as inshore harvesting and so with conventional boats all over the japanese coastline you see this kind of spear fishing gathering going on but on sato island um the tradition was uh, these boats were traditionally used by women and you know you're probably uh given the european uh history of australia a lot of it irish you're probably thinking of the coracle the irish coracle the another famous bowl-shaped boat um and this this has an ancient look but interestingly um, these first appear in the historic record in around the 1860s, 1870s. So they're actually a relatively new boat. Um, and uh, uh, But you see the clear waters that allow this kind of fishing. Um, you also see that the boats are not round, but oval. And this woman, easily a grandmother, if not a great grandmother, um, she's she's paddling from the bow. So she's pushing water, sculling water under the boat to propel it forward. Um, in one village, the men put outboard motors on their boats uh, because their fishing grounds are quite far from the village. And but you notice he steers with the with the sculling paddle uh, at the front of the boat. My teacher uh, on that first trip, there were two men still building tub boats, um, and uh, but my teacher uh, uh, started his career. He was a third generation cooper. And this is a miso factory on Sato Island where his grandfather and father built these miso vats and he spent his career maintaining these vats. Yeah. Um, and mostly that uh, meant replacing these braided bamboo hoops because these deteriorate. The cedar that comprises these vats will last well over a hundred years but the bamboo hoops um, eventually fall apart and have to be replaced. Uh, these are my teacher's tools. These are the classic tools of a cooper. Um, they include a uh, draw knife. This is the Japanese draw knife, uh, the farmer's hatchet for splitting bamboo. These are punches for driving the hoops onto the boat. That's a splitter for splitting the bamboo and then round bottom planes uh, for shaping the staves and then these patterns for the inner and outer curvature of the staves uh, and this is my teacher at work um, he had never had an apprentice uh, it was on my third visit to see him that he invited me to be his apprentice and so i returned in 1996 and uh, worked with him he and i built one boat together i should point out when i describe myself as an apprentice there's really no other word in japanese for me um, but I was only with my teachers for the time it took to build one or two boats. The, the typical boat building apprenticeship in Japan was six years. Um, like most Japanese crafts, very long, arduous apprenticeships. So mine were unnatural in that I was only with my teachers a short period of time. Um, on the other hand, I came into the, my apprenticeships as an experienced woodworker, whereas traditionally, an apprentice would come on the scene at age 13 or 14 with no skills whatsoever and would be would might spend the first two years of their apprenticeship doing nothing more than sweeping or fetching or sharpening tools, which actually, in some cases, the way my my teachers treated me as well. Um, my teacher in this case made me watch him silently for the first two days of our apprenticeship and he sat at his workbench on the floor um, he's shaping the staves checking it here checking the the, ch the shape with his pattern and after two days of me passively watching um, early on the third day he got up pointed to the floor he said work and he walked out of the shop so i sat down i started to make staves uh, I expected him to come back immediately and start hovering over me, but he didn't return for several hours. So I made staves and then he came back. He took my pile of staves and he separated them into uh, a pile of acceptable and unacceptable. 
and he pointed to the unacceptable staves and said, fix them, then clean the shop and come in the house for dinner. And he walked out. And so this was my introduction to Japanese pedagogy, pedagogy, which depends upon the apprentice learning entirely through observation. And note that my teacher didn't explain to me why any of the staves were wrong that I had to fix. He just told me the ones that needed fixing and the ones that were acceptable. And so this was my rude awakening to Japanese apprenticeship. And really all of my teachers with some variations treated me this way. And I'll also point out that almost all of my teachers or really all of my teachers told me the first day of my apprenticeship that there would be absolutely no speaking in the workshop. And that, that I was in no way was I to interrupt them with questions. Um, questions were okay at break time, but uh, not during the workday. We worked in complete silence. So here's my teacher that we've temporarily put the hull together. The hull is pinned with little bamboo nails between each stave, and he's just fairing and smoothing the inside prior to putting the bot bottom in. Splitting the bamboo, um, Sato is very famous for the quality of its timber bamboo. We cut down several stalks that were all over 50 feet long and then split them four ways then split each of these again to get eight strips out of each stalk and then with his draw knife and you see him bracing it with his foot he would pull the strips um, over the blade he's also got a little bamboo fence controlling the angle in his other hand and he could do this just with amazing speed to kind of um, take the, the hard corners off the strips. And then by far the hardest part of building tub boats is braiding the bamboo hoops. And um, you can't adjust the size. These have to be sized perfectly. And these are what hold the boat together. Um, my teacher was an absolute master at this. Um, again, no instruction. Um, I brought a video camera with my uh, with me on my first apprenticeship, and my wife ran the video camera on him uh, while he braided at top speed. And when he was done, uh, he handed me bamboo hoops and told me to braid. And it was just utterly impossible. Um, I came back to the United States to my home, and um, with plastic uh, packing strapping. I watched and rewound my videotape easily a hundred times before I got it. And I did get it. And in many ways, what I did sitting there in front of my TV set with plastic strapping was exactly what the apprentice would be slowly doing over years, watching and assisting his teacher um, and eventually learning how to do this. Um, there's also on Sato Island, the, these boats are now part of the tourist industry. Uh, my teacher was very proud of having made the first glass bottom tub boats, which these school children are looking through. Um, these, young, these women are in what's considered a traditional fishing costume uh, for Sato Island. There's the boat that my teacher and I made together. Um, and I never saw my teacher again. A couple of years after my apprenticeship with him, he died in an accident, and I was contacted by a foundation on the island that said, well, you know, you were his only apprentice, and he never wrote anything down, and so what are we going to do? And so what I suggested was we do the traditional thing, and I taught an apprentice, and this is my apprentice, a carpenter from Sato Island. He and I built two tub boats together, and then... Um, I told the foundation we needed to do a, the non-traditional thing and they needed to publish uh, my research. So this is my first book. It's in English and Japanese, um, The Tub Boats of Sato Island, a Japanese Craftsman's Methods. And uh, it is just simply a how-to book, uh, how to build these boats with a bit of ethnography and history thrown in um, and includes uh, the first published drawings of a tub boat. So um, my teacher never recorded anything. These are his dimensions that he'd use to lay out the tub boats. Um, these are all in shaku, which is the traditional Japanese measuring system. 
Um, uh, you know, Japan is almost universally metric, but in fact, traditional carpenters uh, and other craftspeople still use shaku, which comes straight from China, um, is identical to the Chinese system that it's based on. And I am told that there is no such thing as a metric kimono, that the weavers who make the silk bolts for kimono have always refused to use the metric system. So they use the shaku as well. And so um, I recorded using my teachers uh, and not translating to imperial or metric. Um, as far as secrecy is concerned, there's a very interesting phrase in Japanese, nusumi geiko. If you ever go to Japan and meet a craftsman, um, if you can remember that, invite, uh, uh, invite them to tell you stories about nusumi geiko. Nusumu is the verb to steal. Geiko means lesson. So if your teacher was not a direct family member, like your father or your uncle or so on, um, if you were apprenticed outside of your family, then more than likely that teacher would not teach you everything. They would keep from you the essential secrets of the craft. And um, only a couple of my teachers apprenticed with their fathers and all my other teachers could tell stories about having to steal their master's secrets. And my, my tubboat teacher told me that he would sneak into his master's workshop at night with a candle and study his layout. And in doing so, he discovered that his teacher was were, his teacher was drawing lines that didn't have anything to do with the boat, but were there to throw him off the chase. So that's part of that Japanese apprenticeship is not only powers of observation and perseverance and willingness to sacrifice, but also a, a strong sense of creativity and guile is, is considered part of the Japanese apprentice tradition. Um, here is my step-by-step -step method, drawing courtesy of my wife, uh, to how to braid the bamboo hoops. This is by far the rarest um, skill that I possess. Um, coopers are even, are much rarer than boat builders today in Japan. And I may be among a dozen and no more than two dozen people that can still do the braided bamboo hoops. So just study this and you can do it too. Um, my next apprenticeship was in Urayasu, which is a fishing village just east of Tokyo. Uh, at the time this picture was taken, there were 1,700 registered fishing boats in Urayasu. And this, this little river, the Sakai River, was the default main street of this fishing village. Um, uh, I, was, I was pretty shocked to learn that this photograph, which I think I initially thought was taken in the early 1900s, though I didn't notice this little giveaway here, that automobile, um, this picture was taken in 1964. So, well within most of our lifetimes, an unbelievable culture of wooden boat building. And this is, this is 10 kilometers from downtown Tokyo. So pretty amazing. Um, I was there to build a boat with the last builder in Urayasu, and we were gonna build one of these. This is a seaweed gathering boat called a Bekabune. And these went out into the, and harvested nori, which is the seaweed used, you know, they wrap sushi rolls in, uh, in nori seaweed. Um, this, uh, that's Tokyo Bay in the background. If you go to this bridge today, that's the mouth of the Sakai River. Um, the current mouth of the Sakai River is almost two miles further out. And when you look out at this view, what you see out there is Magic Mountain and Tokyo Disneyland. Because in the 1970s, um, industrial chemical spills destroyed this whole fishery and uh, it was condemned uh, and developers bought the fishing rights to the undersea land and proceeded to fill it in um, more than doubling the size of the city of Urayasu, which is now just a suburb of Tokyo. 
and uh, building suburban, you know, housing. So um, an and incredible transformation almost overnight. Um, and these fishing boats by the hundreds were piled up and burned. So this is my teacher. We worked inside the brand new Urayasu Folk History Museum um, where he taught me. Those are his father's boat building tools in the display cases, which he had donated to the museum. And um, he was uh, a taskmaster. This is a photo I like um, of him watching over me as I'm saw fitting, which I'll talk about a little bit more momentarily. This is the boat. So Japanese boats, just like the tub boat, no workbenches built on the floor on low saw horses or blocks on the floor and almost no use of clamps. Everything is propped mostly overhead, but also to the side. There's a little prop to the side. Um, and uh, and so the building, the shop itself becomes a very important tool. And so in most boat shops, you see very heavy overhead ceiling beams. So you can prop, you see the size of, of some of these timbers um, propping the curve in the bottom. This is an interesting boat because it has, for Japan, because it has a smooth hull. Most of the boats you're gonna see are made with a, with a, uh, a bottom plank and a top plank, but they overlap, kind of a lap strake. And these little mortises uh, at the base of all these are nails. And so this, the two planks of this boat are edge nailed to each other. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Very little framing inside a Japanese boat, and you'll see that. So this is my teacher's drawing of the boat we built. And so at the top of the drawing, you see the profile of the boat. There's the stem at the bow back to the transom and the shear top edge and the chine, the joint between the two planks, and then a plan view, bird's eye view of half of the bottom. But when I saw this drawing, the first time I saw a Japanese boat drawing, I asked the boat builder, you can't build a boat from that. That drawing's incomplete because what you lack is this line and this line in plan view. So you don't know how wide the boat is at either the chine or the shear. And what, what a boat builder will say to you is, that's right, those are my secrets. So in Japan, the irony is that maritime museums have thousands of these drawings in their possession, and you can't build a boat from almost any of them because essential information is missing. And this, ascent, this missing information is obviously to protect the master, protect his secrets, and uh, you know protect him from his competitors. Here's my drawing of the same boat. And here are those two missing lines. Go back. They're, they're missing from this drawing. And my drawings are much more comprehensive. Though I use the same dimensions, I use the same shaku uh, measuring scale that my teachers use. And um, I, here I also record the patterns that uh, my teacher used. We made these two, this pattern is stem angle, transom angle. And this is garboard plank angle at two stations. We made these out of scrap wood using his memorized dimensions. And my teacher told me after every one of these boats, he burned those two patterns. And he built 300 of these seaweed gathering boats. And he told me that at the height of boat building in Urayasu, there were six, what he called boat building houses, because they were extended families of boat builders, all related to one another. And he said the competition was intense. And so therefore the secrecy was intense. Uh, my drawings are in English and Japanese. This is, this is uh, my documentation work. So you see Japanese, Romanized Japanese and English for all my labels. Um, this is my teacher in Tokyo. Uh, now we'll talk a bit about techniques. He's bracing the plank to the floor by bracing it overhead. And then we begin to use a special set of saws to create a watertight fit between the parts of the plank. 
So you, if you're a woodworker, you may know that trick. Um, to make two pieces of wood fit better, you can clamp them up against each other, run a saw through the seam, and that saw will cut a parallel sided gap. And then you can move the two pieces closer together and run the saw again. That's a woodworker's trick. I don't know if that's familiar to any of you, but in Japan, it's an essential part of boat building because Japanese boats are built without caulking. They are watertight upon completion with no caulking whatsoever. It's a wood to wood fit. So we have put the two parts of the plank together, clamped it, we put a clamp on it temporarily, propped it, and my teacher is going, we'll go up and down that seam, sawing, then moving the planks together, sawing through the seam again and again and again and again until he gets a perfectly tight fit. So the genius of this method is that in the initial passes, just to remove a lot of material, you use a normal sawing motion. But what that does is it creates little scratches on the edge of the plank that are in fact channels that can channel water from the outside of the boat to the inside of the boat. And so in your final pass, you rub this way. So all the channels, all the little scratches on the edge of the plank run lengthwise, run along the edge and create no opening for water to pass through the seam. And that the name of this technique, it has several names, but the most common is suriawase. Suru is the verb to rub, and awaseru is the verb to put together. And so really the best English translation, I think, is reconcile. So, and here we have the two side planks for this small boat. They're each comprised of three pieces of wood. And that saw fitting technique has been used to, to make all those seams fit perfectly together. And I would say that for one person, like that seam, which is probably about 16 feet long, that's at least half a day's work of sawing, just sawing, for one skilled person, going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you even you even go to a finer edge, a finer tooth saw, uh, in as you do this. But the boat building saws um, are pretty unique. Um, and then things are edge fastened, as I mentioned earlier, with blacksmith made nails, which are flat steel. And because they're flat steel, you cannot pilot a hole with a drill. You use a special set of chisels. And these are called uh, sword hilt chisels or tsuba nomi, because once you pound it into the wood, you have to hit the hilt to knock it back out. And this is, this is the mortise. The nail is going to come up through the bottom. This mortise goes half the depth of the plank. Japanese boats are planked with much thicker material than Western boats. Again, there's no inter there's very little internal framing. So the strength is all in the hull itself. So this nail is going to come up in here. The nail head will fetch up in the base of that mortise and that can get plugged later. And the nail will come out that rectangular hole cut with that special chisel and go in to the adjacent plank. Here we are cutting our piloting our nail holes from the edges back down into the mortise we've got to meet the base of the mortise it's my teacher and i and there's a cutaway of how this fastening works and when this is done right so you get a look that seam was created with hand saws Okay, that's a pretty impressive seam. And when you're, it's all done and you plane the plank smooth, the apex of this square is on a seam. There's a plank seam running horizontally through the middle of your photograph.
So that is a watertight fit. It's a pretty amazing technology. A bit about other tools. Japanese boat builders all set their angles using a tool like this. The stick has a mark back a known distance. In most cases, it's one shaku. And I might um, point out that for me as an American, I don't know about you as Australians, um, but converting to shaku is extremely easy for me because I, I, and like every American, I can't think in the metric system. I mean, we don't use it. I'm not used to it. Uh, you know, I can't visualize it. But one shaku is 11 and 15 sixteenths inches. So one shaku is a sixteenth of an inch less than a foot. So for me, working in shaku is really, really easy. However, shaku is a decimal system. So un unlike the foot, which is divided into 12, I don't know if I have to reteach Imperial to you Australians, but anyway, I will. <laughs> um, yeah. You may have forgotten it. I can, uh, I can do the metric conversion fairly quickly, Douglas, if you okay, like. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so um, a, sh a shaku is 30.3 centimeters? Correct. A shaku um, is 30.3 centimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, the foot is divided into 12 inches. Uh, the shaku is divided into 10. One shaku is 10 sun. Each sun is 10 bu. A bu is almost exactly an eighth of an inch. So anyway, but back to angles. So this mark is um, one shaku back from the end of the stick. And my teacher has a string with a boat nail as a plumb bob. And he records every angle in the boat as the horizontal distance from the string to the one shaku mark. And this is really universal throughout Japan using this kind of homemade tool. So that's how angle, so an angle is simply re remembered as this horizontal dimension. And we're setting the, the garboard plank on our second boat. Um, in terms of teaching, this was an interesting moment in Tokyo. Again, my teacher, uh, he forbade speaking in the workshop. I worked with him for seven months and I was expected to learn via observation. Um, uh, if I made a mistake, I was sent back to sweeping, which I can tell you uh, will really hone your uh, desire to get it right the next time. Um, and, and, you know, and I, and I don't say that really as a joke. I mean, I think that's built into the Japanese apprentice system. It's really a crucible. The apprentice is really thrown into the fire and, you know, you want to get out of the fire. Uh, and so you become a pretty intense learner as a result. I have great admiration, uh, for this teaching method. And I'll talk, uh, toward the end, I'll talk about how I've tried to, bring that into my own teaching. But anyway, one day my teacher surprised me and he said, uh, he said, Brooks, come over here. Uh, I've got something to teach you. And so one and only time he ever said that to me. And he took a piece of wood. Boat builders never draw on paper. They always draw on planks of wood because it's more permanent. And he made this sketch of our bottom plank and he explained that we needed to get an angle here and we had to determine exactly what an offset was. And then he drew this straight line and then he fell silent. He drew these straight lines with his square, drew these two lines and determined this little offset here. And when he was done, he looked up at me and he said, did you understand that? And I said, no. And he looked at me and he said, if you don't understand this, you can't call yourself a boat builder. And you can see, where he took his hand plane and he planed off, he erased the lines that he first drew. And, you know, the cryptic thing that he said to me, he certainly had my undivided attention. My hair was standing up on the back of my neck. And he drew all those lines over again, working silently. And he looked up at me the second time and he said, now do you understand it? And I said, no. And he put this down and he said, get back to work. And he never mentioned this again. At lunchtime, I grabbed this plank 
and I ran to the nearest convenience store and I put it on the copy machine and I made copies of it. And I used to get this out periodically and look at it. And I used to lay, literally used to lay in bed at night and think about this. And about two years later, I figured this out. But what's interesting, from my teacher's point of view, he felt no responsibility to teach me this. It was entirely my responsibility to learn this. And uh, uh, again, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very, very powerful teaching style. Um, may not be for everybody. <laughs> anyway, this is our boat in Tokyo. Uh, we bent the bottom plank, we bent the side plank with uh, fire. Uh, the Japanese don't use steam. Like most of Asia, planks are bent over an open flame. So the charred inside of the planking, this is our boat coming together. And this is that same boat on launch day. So you see again, just the horizontal beams for framing. They mortise shouldered and mortised into the side planks uh, and a beautiful boat. If, if you go to Tokyo, get in touch with me. Um, this boat is used by a nonprofit group that teaches traditional rowing in a canal in the middle of Tokyo. And you can go, you can row this boat if you like. Uh, in the far north, the boats change actually pretty significantly. This is my teacher uh, starting to hack out our first day on the job, starting to hack out the stem for our fishing boat. He had no drawings at all. Um, in fact, as I traveled north, I was looking for boat builders and meeting boat builders. And by about halfway up the country, uh, no boat builder had a drawing. It just disappeared in northern Japan and Hokkaido. No tradition of drawings whatsoever. So my teacher just had a few patterns, these, these plank angle patterns. You know, only he knew where to place them. Um, and so on again secrecy here he is so we have propped our garbled plank propped above and below propped off to the side walls and he's running the saw back and forth and back and forth prior to nailing that plank to the bottom making that seem a perfect fit and there here and he and i working together i'm saw fitting the seam over on the port side of the boat and he's up here in the stem rabbit, working from inside the boat, getting that fit in that rabbit joint along the curved stem. So again, every joint in the boat fit with hand saws. Um, it turned out the tradition in his village uh, was famous for carvings uh, on, on the fishing boats. And so this was really, really great. Uh, to see, although he he said that um, under no circumstances could I do any carving because the as an apprentice because the carving was his signature. So these are some of the motifs. We car he carved these on a separate piece of wood that we then fastened to the stern of the boat. Um, it was my job as apprentice to paint the carvings. This is the Chinese peony, which has. Um, great symbolism in Buddhism, which is kind of interesting. And I never got a full explanation for this because all ceremonies around boats and boat building in Japan are Shinto. And this was an example that Shinto is Japan's native religion. Uh, and yet this was a very, uh, what I've been told was a very strong Buddhist motif, though there is a lot of overlap between Shintoism and Buddhism in Japan. And there's our finished boat. This boat did have big sawn frames. Um, so that was a bit of an exception and that is something seen in Northern Japan. Um, so beautiful, beautiful boat. And then down to Okinawa. And Okinawa is a very interesting story, um, a completely different culture. Uh, Native Okinawans do not consider themselves Japanese um, and they make a very, very unique boat. But what's wonderful about Okinawa is the, this is the, the really the one and only place in Japan where there's a true revival of wooden boat building. And what happened in the 1990s was that yachtsmen and board sailors and surfers 
began to rediscover the traditional Okinawan fishing boat and began to race them. So like Europe, like America, no doubt like Australia, so many traditional designs get saved when they become repurposed as pleasure boats. So you want to save a traditional craft, turn it into a competition. And uh, so these folks are all racing. These, uh, this is, boat is called the Sabani, and the Sabani is a, a semi dugout. So my teacher was one of only three men left who had ever built Sabani. He, like the other two craftspeople, he was, you know, quite old um, and had stopped building Sabani by 1960 and transitioned into fiberglass, modern fiberglass fishing boats. And so the Sabani was abandoned, completely abandoned by fishermen, you know, a, more than a generation ago. And my teacher told me that in, so 30 years later, 35 years later, these racing teams come to him and say, we want to commission a Sabani from you. And he told me my first thought was, do I still remember all those dimensions? And he showed me these four sheets of plywood because he made four sizes of Sabani and he wrote down all the memorized dimensions. So he recorded himself. Um, needless to say, I tucked these under my arm. I ran to the copy store, I ran to the convenience store <laughs> and I put all four of these on the copy machine. So I made sure that I had a record of this, but we, he and I built uh, a Sabani together. Now I want you to look closely. So in, we call a Sabani a semi dugout. So it's composed of very large timbers put together and then the hull is essentially carved to shape. So it's not a true dugout. It's not made of a single log. These are the two side planks. They are, and Mitch can translate into centimeters if we need him. Um, these planks were two inches thick, 30 inches wide, and 26 feet long. Japanese cedar. We carved them out. They are full thickness here at the gunnel. Then we took away half the thickness through most of the side of the plank. Then we left them to full thickness again. This is, this is a shelf to support the floorboards. Then we carve them half away again and quickly transition back to full thickness where they were gonna join the bottom. And my teacher used to do this with hand planes uh, and an ads. Uh, back in the old days. He didn't get he didn't get electric power until the mid 1960s when he had stopped. He had already stopped building Sabani. So he built about 100 Sabani, he told me, from the end of World War II till the early 1960s. He built them all entirely with hand tools. But we were using, as you can see, we were using power tools. We set the uh, the Sabani is the only small boat in Japan built upside down. All the other boats you've seen here are built right side up, but the Okinawans work upside down. And here we are over a three-day period. We temporarily put turnbuckles um, to pull these slowly pull these planks together while I played hot water over the side planks using a diesel-powered boiler. And then we dropped this six-inch thick cedar bottom once we had our side planks bent properly we dropped this and began to fit and carve this bottom now one of the main reasons i wanted to study okinawan boat building is the fact that sabani use no metal fastenings whatsoever they are fastened with these hardwood dovetail keys and i really wanted to see how this was done so here's my teacher. He's bandsawed the shape out of long pieces of hardwood, and now he's just cutting them out with the bandsaw. And here they are. So that bottom, that thick bottom, was comprised of three pieces of wood. The two side ones are missing. And here we've put that bottom fully together. 
and you see the dovetail keys. These go half the depth, these go about an inch, sorry, these go about an inch. They are one shaku apart. And on the inside of the boat, in between them is another set from the inside, again, one shaku apart. So it's an alternating fastening system. So there you go. There's the bottom. It's after being put together, it's getting hollowed out. And then we're, we use a chain fall overhead, we turn it over and we, we fit it to the side planks. Now, a lesson in how these fastenings work. Here's our two planks. You can see the seam between them. We put down the dovetail key, we label it because the keys are not, they're not identical. So every key has gotta be custom fit. We trace it out with a very sharp pencil. We take a drill, and we just get rid of most of the wood with a drill. And then here's the, here's the important part. We chisel it. Now look carefully. We chisel all the way to the corners. I have not finished chiseling the ends, but we chisel all the way to the corners. But everybody see that pencil line? As I chisel into the center, I leave it slightly heavy. Okay, all the way around, it's slightly heavy in the middle then we check the hardwood key we actually want it to be loose top and bottom we want there to be a little bit of play top and bottom and then we drive it in tight and i pre-soak it with a little bit of soybean oil and what this does if you can try to visualize this is that that little wedge left that little bit of material left acts like four wedges and so when that hardwood key goes in it pulls those two planks together yeah i see a little consternation on people's faces i'm sorry for that but if you imagine just think about one edge here as that hardwood goes in and it's fighting that little sliver of cedar it makes that piece of cedar want to go down it makes this piece of cedar want to come up and that's how this works and here's here's the boat fully fastened you can see the dovetail keys and then we roll the boat there's a there's a bow piece and there's a corresponding piece at the stern. And then we rolled the boat over and we did the dovetail fastenings around the inside. Again, alternating. Uh, and also this turnbuckle eventually came out. But, and then these spreader bars went in too. But one thing I'll point out here is the absolutely beautiful shape of the Sabani. I mean, they are just, one of the most frustrating things of that apprenticeship was photographing the boat and trying to capture its inherent beauty. They are, they are just incredible. Um, so, and here's a look at the bow. Again, fastened with the dovetail keys, including a double dovetail and these cedar, these cedar spikes, which were obviously sawn off and plain flush. One other thing to note if you look closely at the end grain of these two planks these are adjacent planks out of the law out of the same log and japanese boat builders work this way where the boat is built symmetrically from the log and so if you visualize a round log being flat sawn the keel of the boat comes out of the center plank and then the, the next plank comes out of the two planks, either side of the center plank and so on. And um, I used to think that was just an old wives tale. You know, it was just this belief that Japanese boat builders had, you know, the, the wood should be used symmetrically from the log, you know, okay, great idea. And then it was when I was here in Okinawa that I realized if you didn't do this, given the thickness of these planks, if you took if you may if you took side planks from two separate logs 
or you didn't use them symmetrically from the same log, they wouldn't bend the same. I mean, you could never guarantee that they would bend the same. And so your boat would be, you know, completely asymmetrical. And so given that Japanese boat builders plank with much thicker stock, which is harder to bend, and given that the Okinawa and the Sabani is really the most heavily planked boat of all, um, book matching the side planks makes absolute sense. And I think would be a disaster if you tried it any other way. Uh, my teacher's baler. This was carved out of a single piece of hard pine. And he told me that the curve on the bottom perfectly fit the curve of the bottom of our boat. Uh, you can't talk about Okinawa without talking about World War II. These are American fighter planes. Um, this is the island where I studied, little island of Iejima, just three miles wide by four miles long. It was the scene of, of some of the worst fighting in the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, it was because the Japanese had built an airstrip there and the Americans wanted that airstrip. Um, three quarters of the island's civilian population was killed in the battle, including um, my teacher's two older brothers. Um, he was just a young teenager uh, uh, at the time. But these are um, P-47 Thunderbolt fighter planes after, after the battle. And I bring your draw your attention to these aluminum uh, drop tanks. These carried gasoline, extra gasoline, but if the plane got into a dogfight, they could be dropped to give the fighter plane more maneuverability. So thousands of these drop tanks fell down on the battlefields of Europe and the Pacific. And in Okinawa, the fishermen turned them into boats. And uh, the Japanese word for boat is uh, fune or bune. And these are called tank bune in the Okinawan language. And while I was on uh, Iejima, uh, the mayor introduced me to a 93-year-old fisherman, octopus fisherman, who is still going out in his World War II aluminum drop tank uh, to go fish for octopus. And the only thing he said was, um, you know, it's a great boat, it'll last forever, but they're very unstable. So, but, that, but these are not uncommon. Uh, even to this day, you can find these. They, they're not they're not really used anymore, but you know they're in museum collections. This is in a museum on the island, uh, and this is our boat at launching. That's my teacher on the right, and the Okinawan native the 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 native religion in Okinawa, the indigenous religion, is a kind of shamanism, and it's practiced by women. All the officiates are female, and um, there are two levels of shaman, and this, this woman was 94 years old, lived on the island, and she had not made it to the top level. She was a second level shaman, but she was all we had, and um, she officiated in the launching ceremony. Um, nice story in Okinawa. Uh, of the three elderly men, my teacher has passed away. Uh, one of the other uh, teachers has retired due to ill health. One of the older men is still building boats. And this woman on the left is now, um, uh, uh, she apprenticed with one of the other builders and she is now building. This is a launch ceremony for a Sabani, this one here that she built for this customer on the right. So she is Japan's only woman uh, professional boat builder um, but I know one other woman who apprenticed with a boat builder. So it's a really great story. And this is part of the launching ceremony. And there's her boat with an, a historic boat. Um, one nice thing about these semi dugouts, because they're so thick, they last a long time. And uh, here she is paddling her new boat or the boat she just finished. And this is the annual Sabani race. And there, uh, currently there are almost 40 teams. And if you look down the line, you see both new boats and old boats. So teams are finding old boats and restoring them, but also commissioning new boats. So this is a really viable, you know, really the craft is coming back and it's all thanks to uh, young people who, you know, are just 
are just jazzed at the idea of learning the old ways of sailing sailing these boats. Um, now to the tsunami coast in the far north. I took this photo four years before the tsunami struck. Um, one of the tragedies of the tsunami, I, I was told that 95% of all the boats on that coastline were destroyed in the disaster. Um, when I traveled that coast, and I've been to all 47 of Japan's prefectures, uh, there were more wooden boats on that coast than any place else in Japan. And yet that was where the tsunami struck. So this photo I took, all wooden boats, you know, this was just completely destroyed in the disaster. There's one modern fiberglass boat there in the background. So I resolved, uh, uh, I, knew the, I knew one boat builder and he had built all these boats actually. And I, it, took, it took four years to raise the funding, but eventually I, I raised enough funding to go and work with him. So here we are, dirt floor workshop, uh, no drawings. He's laying the lines out of the bottom, um, bending the bottom. We propped it, that's a two inch thick bottom plank, propped under his house with a fire. Um, he had a series of posts, you see the posts, each one got shorter, and then he had this boulder. So after 15 minutes, he put his shoulder under there, took that post out and put a post in that was a little bit shorter. And he had these all calibrated for doing this. He said he had built about a hundred of these boats in his career. So he knew he had this figured out. Um, so my job as apprentice, uh, uh, you know, was to record all his dimensions. So one day, um, he took my bevel gauge and he walked over to the side of the shop and he put it up to the beam and then he walked back to the boat and I thought, what, what the heck did he just do over there? And I walked over and all the angles needed to build this boat, he had recorded on a beam uh, on, in his shop. What was interesting about this moment was that he didn't tell me this. And had I been looking out the window or not paying attention, I would have missed this. And I would have never known this. Um, so again, all part of uh, the apprentice training. So here's our boat going together, the use of props in every direction. And you see these are bulkheads for a live well in the middle of this fishing boat. Otherwise, these beams shouldered into the side planks. Interesting, a false stem. The only time I've seen this in Japan where there was a two-piece stem, an inner stem, and then later we trimmed the planks and we put on an outer stem. It's the only time I've seen that in Japan. And now a quiz question for you. Here's the transom of the boat. Like a lot of Japanese boats, the planks run, the side planks run past the transom. He came over here and he measured a distance back. He made a mark. He cut that angle. Then he went over to the other side of the boat. You can see he put the same mark. You can see the mark. And then he's got his handsaw. And it was obvious to me as he sawed, he was simply aligning his saw with the previous cut that he had made. He didn't, he never drew an angle here and he never drew an angle there. Question, how did he get this angle? And you're free to, I guess, unmute yourself if you have an answer. I'll hazard a guess. Uh, there was a mark on the opposite wall that he was aligning his saw with. Do you see anything that matches that? It wouldn't be visible from your angle because you're looking at the opposite wall to him. Uh, but remember, he cut this first. So oh. he was in the photographer's view. Mm. You're right. 
you'd have to you are one of just a handful of people to ever get that so the point is what are your powers of observation right and if you look and look some people say oh he lined it up with the door frame and you know obviously that's not true um but if you look closely enough you see that angle and that's that is up to the apprentice to figure that out so yeah great great answer congratulations uh, so. so sorry douglas can i just ask did you see that at the time or is something that you that's something you observed afterwards i um i figured it out i was on to him because he had pulled those other angles off the walls of his shop and so when he did this work um i was basically looking over his shoulder and i noticed that line on the wall yeah so and here's that finished boat um and there i am out sculling it in the harbor that, by the way, that that coastline that was struck by the tsunami is one of the most beautiful parts of Japan. And I, um, wonderful people, uh, many Japanese felt that that whole region should just be written off after the disaster. You know, villages abandoned, people relocated. But it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, I really urge people to visit there. It, it is it's so beautiful. Um, and the, the remains of the tsunami, which are still very, very visible, are very, very sobering, but um, it's, it's really one of, it's a place that's become one of my favorite parts of Japan. So that's Iwate and Miyagi prefectures and Fukushima prefectures. But the beautiful rocky coastline is mostly Iwate prefecture. Um, a, a, a year later, I was invited by the Takenaka Carpentry Tools Museum in Kobe to um, build a boat as an exhibition. And I chose that same boat because I felt the tsunami gave that boat kind of a national significance. Um, if you go to Japan, you must go visit this museum. Um, this is one of the most beautiful museums in Japan. Uh, if you have even a passing interest in Japanese carpentry, uh, you will be absolutely blown away. This is really a phenomenal, phenomenal place. So this is my temporary, beautiful architect designed museum, and they set up a temporary boat shop for me. So I built the same boat. And um, as part of that exhibition, I advertised uh, four Saturday boat building workshops. And after just a few days on the museum's Facebook page, they had to shut down enrollment at 60 people per workshop. Um, there is really a groundswell of interest in learning Japanese boat building, but in the Japanese tradition, um, there's then it, nothing's accessible because you know you need to find a master. And I'm providing a very Western idea here of teaching a workshop. And actually, if you go to Japan, what you find, there are craft schools, but there are very, very few of them. And they're typically, you know, very young institutions. This is a Western idea. Um, Japan is still, to this day, the crafts are, are conducted and taught in a very, very traditional way. Um, so uh, it's not going to save the craft of boat building. And I've got some plans regarding that. So there's that boat on, there's me rowing um, that, the boat I built, the same boat, exactly the same boat as I built with my teacher in Kobe Harbor on launch day. Um, then I went to Gifu in 2017, and these are the iconic Cormorant fishing boats. Um, another really unique design, again, my first river boat, um, no internal framing at all. Um, and these sticks, these smaller sticks, are actually just temporary. When you're done fishing, you just pop those in to maintain the shape of the boat. These boats are really only, the only framing is the single beam amidships. That's it. So uh, if you're not aware, uh, there is a 1,300-year tradition in Japan of fishing with birds. So these cormorants are on leashes. Um, this is all a very traditional Thing in Gifu, there are six hereditary 
uh, cormorant fisherman. The senior fisherman is the 18th generation of his family to do this. Uh, they wear these traditional outfits. The, you know, they burn the fire to attract the fish at night, and the birds are on leashes. Uh, they dive for the fish. The fisherman pulls them into the boat and then squeezes the fish out of their mouths. Um, the the gifu, the six gifu fishermen, are actually employed by the emperor. Um, this is considered, you know, one of Japan's premier uh, cultural treasures. And yet, this is one of the tourist boats. Um, also, a really nice uh, wooden boat. Um, but at the moment, uh, this is very precarious because the one builder of these boats is now 89 years old. And I am his second apprentice. So they're wait the tourists are waiting for night to fall. And this is my teacher. Um, we made a deal. I had been asking him for 15 years if I could study with him. And for 15 years, he said no. And then he said yes. But he told me he was too old to do any of the work. And so would I, would I do all the physical labor? And he all he could do physically was lay down the lines of the boat. But we're going to show you a little video here. Um, I had a couple volunteers on the project. This this man in the background is a volunteer from California. Um, my teacher did a did a kind of interesting um, technique nailing that 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 a minority of Japanese boat builders do, and I thought you'd find it interesting. I've got to bring down my volume. And uh, hang on. And one thing you'll notice right before he puts the boat the nail in the hole he licks the nail and we um we pre-rusted these nails by soaking them in brine so these were completely covered with rust and he insisted i pass every single nail through my mouth i can tell you it's tasteless and i presumably it doesn't hurt any i'm still here um, but this boat had 963 nails so here we go. Hang on. How did, did Mitch, did that come through good? Mitch? Uh, yeah, I, I, I got that. I hope everyone got that. Um, I hope everyone got that. Fairly important so I, I am going to send all of you through Mitch. I'm going to send you a follow-up email, and I'm going to send you a couple of videos of this technique by different craftspeople. So you'll get to watch it at your leisure. Like I say, about a third of boat builders, only two of my teachers did this, um, but they all insisted I had to do it. And then uh, the first thing I did was I imitated their rhythm and they immediately chastised me and said that their rhythm was their signature and I had to come up with my own signature rhythm. Um, the justification for it is that edge nailing has a great risk of splitting the planks and that by playing the light and hard that you can control uh, the, you know, the, the insertion of the nail in the hole and prevent the planks from splitting. So that they they insisted on that. Uh, the teachers of mine who didn't do this just thought it was bunk, just thought it was a complete joke and had complete disdain for it. So, but you know, a significant number of craftspeople do this. Um, as far as thickness, this is a relatively thin plank. Uh, these cormorant boats are 42 feet long and the planking is just a little over an inch thick, which is absurd. Uh, so this is really quite thin planking. But anyway, um, you'll see more of that. So that's our bottom, uh, the narrow planking all edge nailed together. And then um, using boulders to hold the boat in place while we, and also props while we put the side planks on. 
And again, this is another rare boat in Japan that's smooth planked, no overlapping planking. But you see all those nails. That's how you get 963 nails. And then my teacher trimming off uh, at the bow, the deck support. And then uh, and th that boat, I, I planed that boat inside and out with a hand plane. Everything was finished with a hand plane, which is true of really all the boats you've seen today. Uh, nothing was, there were almost no power tools used really in any of the boats that, that I'm showing you here tonight, today. So um, this is classic Japanese riverboat style in this region of Gifu. And then launch ceremony uh, in Gifu, the tradition is a new boat is capsized three times upon launch and a boat capsized three times will never capsize again. So here we are, the owner on the left, my two volunteers and myself, and we're about ready to roll the boat over for the first time. Um, so this apprentice system, you know, everything you've seen tonight are basic workaday fishing boats. Um, but I, I want to point out that the craftspeople that came through this kind of training are, are craftspeople of incomparable skill. So here's a man who built fishing boats, small fishing boat, inboard powered fishing boats his entire life. And in retirement, he made this inlaid valise. He made this bentwood vase that's sitting in front of him. And he's also Japan's only builder of these. Um, he built four of these replica sailing ships. These are from the Edo era. So from the late 1600s uh, through, actually these were built right up until the early 1900s. Very little change. Um, and here's a historic photo. Interestingly, uh, a Western gaff rigged mizzen mast. So this is after contact with the West and actually a foremast of a foresail of some type because traditionally these only flew a single uh, square rectangular sail. Uh, below decks on one of the replica ships. Here's the stern. This is the fourth and final cargo vessel he built. I was lucky enough to stay in the shipyard. Uh, I, I got to stay in the shipyard right after, right before it was launched. Um, very characteristic. The 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 rudder can be lifted straight up. You can actually see the block arrangement with the rope and the block. So this boat could be beached. You could treat this like a small boat, actually, and you could beach this and pull up its rudder into this well here. Um, in many ways, built like Japan's small boats uh, with no internal framing except these beams running across the ship. Um, really, really amazing. Um, the four replicas, uh, three of the four, uh, well, this one, uh, 100 feet long and 100 tons displacement. And the fourth and final one is the only one that ever actively sailed. Uh, and it sailed for about five or six years, and it's now ashore, uh, like the other ones, as a static display. One of the... One of the statistics I like to tell about the construction of this last one is the master. Um, this was built in 11 months by 15 shipwrights, average age 69. And uh, so you see the precariousness of, um, of the craft. Interesting. Um, you see the daylight through the sails. The panels of the sails are loosely woven together. This is a Japanese technique. So when the wind picked up, they spread apart and spilled the wind. So it's an automatic reefing system to slow the boat down. I've developed, 
I've developed a, a series of classes in Japanese boat building. The first, it was a month long college class. This is one of my college classes, students um, uh, fitting, uh, saw fitting the planking, but it's really a class about Japanese pedagogy. And so we try to create a completely silent classroom. And what I tell my students the first day is, because they're pretty shocked at this idea of a silent classroom. And what I say is the teacher will not teach, but the apprentice is required to learn. And we do readings uh, uh, about Japanese Zen and Buddhism and, and sort of the underpinnings of this education method. And we have discussions and write papers outside of the workshop. But in the course of this class, we build traditional Japanese river boats. Here's our Shinto launching and uh, launch in the college swimming pool. So this is a this is a small river boat from the Kyoto area that I've taught a number of times. Here's um, the most ambitious boat. We built a 27 foot river boat in a month with 15 students and launch again in the swimming pool. Um, here are my students piloting those nail holes, planing, and launch. And in that class, we built, we got the whole class in the one bigger boat. And then we built two boats in that class. You see the hardwood dovetail keys. Um, in some river valleys in Japan, boats are fastened with a combination of boat nails and hardwood dovetail keys. Uh, finally, in 19, uh, 2019, I got to apprentice with the last builder, 85 years old at the time, of these river boats that I had been teaching. And here we are, bottom plank, his pattern for the plank bevel, his joint joining the bow and stern transom to the bottom plank, putting the side plank, wrapping the side planks around the hull, the bark is still on them. The patterns, no drawings. And then I think we're plugging knots here. You see the beautiful wide cedar that you can still get in Japan. And my assistant, I took an apprentice with me. Um, she's an administrator and a graduate of the apprentice shop in Rockland, Maine, which is America's oldest boat building school. And she came with me. You see the wedges holding the side seam open so she can run the saw freely through there. Then my teacher used raw lacquer as a bedding compound, mixed it with flour. And that's what we put as kind of a primitive waterproofing in between the seams. And there's Nina hand planing the inside of the boat. We'll flip the boat over, my teacher adds in the extra material off the bottom of the side planks. I'm planing the outside of the boat, just the one beam for framing. And there's, uh, we took a videographer with us. That's the completed boat. And then we did a second apprenticeship. This is the, the last one I'll be showing you uh, with this man. And he's kind of typical of both uh, uh, himself and the previous boat builder and really all the boat builders I know that are still active. He is just old enough to have apprenticed with his father in his 20s, teens and 20s, building wooden boats, but then switched to fiberglass. So he just, he and the previous teacher, they both just caught the tail end of a tradition of wooden boats. And so now late in life, they've come back to wooden boat building, teaching people like me. We built our boat. Oh, what happened there? Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. Okay, thank you. We used his grandfather's plank drawing. So you have to look very carefully there to see the lines of the boat. 
one tenth scale. Nina uh, piloting nail holes. There's the transom and the backbone set up to the side. My teacher using the same, he's setting the angle of the transom using the same tool. The joint where the stem connects to the bottom plank. See that little bit of joinery? And then that mortise was cut to receive that. And then this was the construction that I wanted to see and document. Um, I'm not quite sure what to call this, kind of a, a tunnel type structure at the bow of these boats. Um, and then saw fitting. And there it is finished. And then we can run that first plank from the bot, the keel, right up the side of that. The box, it's a box construction. Nina playing a propane torch while my teacher bends, slowly bends the plank. The props, it gets kind of crazy. And then um, this was a, a net tending boat. So a combination of very stout, this boat's only 14 feet long, but a crazy combination of very stout beams and big, big uh, sawn frames. And you can see the, the charred surface from the bending process. Big, big sawn frames, although they're cedar. So, the, I mean, they're not hardwood, but they're still, they're, uh, you know, quite massive. Getting near completion. And there's the finished boat. Launch ceremony conducted by the boat builder. I've participated in, you know, two dozen uh, Shinto launching ceremonies in Japan. And most of the time it's just the boat builder and the client, uh, sometimes with a priest, but that costs money. So, and I've conducted these ceremonies myself. They're, there's, you know, they're very, they're standard, but they all have a local flavor. So various, fruits of nature you know shintoism is deeply connected to nature it's hard to see but there's a pair of fish on this little altar obviously sake rice wine um, this is a bag of salt salt is a purifier um, they didn't even bother to take it out of the plastic bag because it was going to go right back into my teacher's um, kitchen not going to waste it uh, and then after the ceremony uh, take the boat take the boat out so that's um, my last image, and let's turn it over to questions. I thank you very much for indulging me, um, and I hope you've enjoyed this so far. So yeah. I'll, I will, uh, I guess I should stop share, Mitch. Right. Okay. Thank you, Douglas. Um, I know that many of you will have questions. If Rather than everyone trying to ask once, maybe if you could just put a, a little indication in the chat that you have a question, and that way I can go through the questions and we can go through them one by one. Um, if you'd like to do that and put a question in the chat, please do. I know that Luke sent through a question for Douglas prior to the session. Um, right. So Luke, if you wanted to unmute yourself and have a chat with Douglas, um, please do. Hi Douglas, I sent you the question, um, but I can't remember it verbatim. But my the point of the question was, there are specific um, environmental conditions in Japan associated with the, the sea currents. And one famous one is the Black Sea current that brings right. warm water to that east coast of Japan. And that has influenced um, the kinds of trees that grow in that environment, but also um, perhaps the way people relate to the sea. And, and I was wondering if that sort of natural phenomenon is evident in the both the design and the uh, construction fabrication techniques of the boats, especially along that east coast. Have you had any insight into that? What I would say is that current famously creates some of the richest fishing grounds in Japan. And that Sanriku coast, where the tsunami struck, is famous for its inshore fisheries um, and that's quite 
that's right now incredibly controversial because at the Daiichi nuclear power plant, um, they're overwhelmed with the, the cooling water to keep the reactor from uh, uncontrolled meltdown. And the Japanese government has just announced they're going to start releasing that irradiated water right into that current, which is going to carry it right through that fishing ground. And this is, uh, I mean, this is a really, really scary thing. Um, but to answer your question, what, what I would say is I don't, I, I, I think it's um, maybe a chain of connection that creates a very rich fishing environment. And in fact, on that coastline, there is quite a profusion of small boats um, because, you know, they, they take advantage of the kinds, the, the, the multiple catches that are available there. And so inshore fishing is really common along that coastline. And that's that boat you saw, uh, the guy who cut with the line on his wall, and uh, that's from that region. Um, as far as affecting the design of the boat, you know, I think, I, personally, I think boat design is more a function of materials plus technology. So Japan is blessed with these amazing old growth cedar forests. And these are really found nearly nationwide, not in Okinawa, not in Hokkaido, but the bulk of the country has available to it, readily available to it, you know, massive pieces of cedar. And if you think about it, I mean, if you build boats in Australia or like I do in America, you know, we're planking our boats with these little narrow planks because it's all we can get. And you saw in this 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 uh, this slideshow today that Japanese boat builders have the luxury of these enormous wide planks. So almost every boat you saw tonight is just a flat keel, two garboard planks, two shear planks, one, two, three, four, five. If you want to count the keel, and that to me that's just that just comes straight away from. The material they've got at hand if if the british <laughs> had had trees like that <laughs> um they probably would not have built little narrow planked clinker boats you know if the vikings had had trees like that they wouldn't have invented little narrow planked clinker boats so um that's my answer uh you know i hope that doesn't disappoint you but that's definitely that no, definitely that current is it creates the environment for the fisheries which then demand the boats yeah thank you and thanks sure. for the presentation no oh, thank you did did anyone have some more questions for for douglas i'm jotting down some questions that i have for douglas so i don't forget all of them but i uh you know i don't want to take other people's time yeah. okay sorry I'm I just had a question about um, the finish on the boats. I noticed that the Japanese cedar must be very um, able to withstand the um, environment because I didn't notice that they had any coatings or, or finish on the, on the timber. That's right. So most of the boats you saw were unfinished. Um, you yeah. might have seen boats in the background that had paint. Paint didn't become widely available till after World War II. Mm -hmm. And initially it was just bottom paint. Yeah. Um, so, so traditional Japanese small fishing boats were pulled out of the water every day, okay. pulled up onto the ramp. They don't have docks, yeah. they have ramps mm -hmm. or beaches. Yeah. And okay. um, so, and the Japanese cedar is very rot resistant. Plus there is a tradition of Japan of leaving wood unfinished. So, mm -hmm. so domestic architecture, yeah. shrines and temples, Mm. are unfinished cedar and cypress okay. and the japanese had that tradition um there was an early tradition of treating the bottom of boats by burning rice straw yep. and rubbing sort of mm -hmm. charcoalizing the bottom of boats yep. and some of you may know that architectural technique of burning and carbonizing mm. japanese yep. planks it was the boat builders equivalent of that Okay. Um, they didn't actually set fire to the planks the way uh, yep. builders do, um, yep. uh, but they, like I said, they rubbed ash yep. on the planking. Yep. So yep. then in, in the modern era, 
wooden boats started to get covered in fiberglass, which was a mixed mm. blessing. Uh, yep. It's done poorly. It actually provo promotes rot. But yep. yeah, the traditionally okay. built boats you saw in this presentation, mm. most of them just got modern bottom paint and nothing yep. else. Yeah. Okay, it's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Douglas, we have a question from Dale, which links to your discussion of Japanese forests and the use of cedar. Uh, just asking, how have centuries of boat building and other construction not resulted in deforestation? Do you have any points you'd like to touch on in on forestry management? Well, the, I mean, the Japanese had um, the Japanese, you know, had a, a deep affinity for the natural world. I mean, that's built right into Shintoism, their native religion. And there were forestry practices that go back you know, hundreds of years. Really, the biggest uh, uh, the the biggest demand on forestry materials was right after World War II to literally rebuild the country, and there was a there was a big push to actually take rice paddies and grow cedars, and you can still see the remnants of that in various rural parts of Japan where rice farmers were encouraged to start planting trees. Um, the Japanese cedar grows fairly quickly. So, you know, it can it can be sustainably harvested on a on a, you know, on a rotational schedule. Um, uh, boat building, you know, the England was famously disforest, uh, deforested to build the Royal Navy fleets. Um, I guess it's true to say that that really the volume of wood uh, in Japanese boat building didn't really match that. That's a guess. But um, Japan has a lot of forested land. And uh, I, I've heard boat builders being picky about can they still find the really, really, really high quality trees, but they can find good cedars. And I, I've never encountered a boat builder who talked about any kind of absolute, you know, actual problem getting material. Um, yeah, we don't think of Japan as a forested country. We think of it as a giant city. Uh, but it isn't. It's it's just amazing. Some of the most amazing old growth forests I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Timber is not really an issue. Yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Jake also had a question for you. When you're ready, Jake. Just want to say uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. It meant a bit to see the uh, boat building from the north. Uh, I had some. Uh, family connections back that way, so it's nice to see some of the boats. Continuing north, have you had any contact with the uh, Ainu people? And do they have any kind of more particular boat building traditions compared to the rest of Japan and perhaps Russia? Uh, yeah, so the Ainu are really so the Ainu are considered the indigenous Japanese, and they were pushed north. Um, uh, as the Asian Japanese moved, you know, from China through Korea into southern Japan, you know, we're talking prehistory and pushed north. The Ainu were steadily uh, pushed north and, and eventually are really associated now with Hokkaido. Um, in Hokkaido, the, the uh, Ainu had two native traditions. They have a dugout tradition, and that's still maintained. Um, one, the Nibutani uh, Ainu Cultural Center. Uh, still sponsors the construction every year or so of a uh, of a dugout, a traditional Ainu dugout canoe. And the Ainu also made a bark canoe, which is kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I live in New England in the USA where we have a famous tradition of birch bark, Native American birch bark canoe. So the Ainu had a bark canoe. But then later, after contact with the Japanese, um, the Ainu developed plank built boats and they sewed them together. So they, uh, I guess a shortage or inability to process iron, not sure, but there was a, the, and I've seen a few replicas of these boats. Uh, if you're familiar, I don't know where your family's from, but Aomori City, uh, the Michinoku Traditional Wooden Boat Museum, they sponsored the construction of an Ainu boat with sewn it looks a lot like the the typical japanese boat but the planks are sewn together with a natural fiber really interesting um 
But again, uh, Nibutani is a very well-known Ainu Heritage Center. And if you Google them, um, you, you can learn. I, in fact, I just saw a YouTube video of a launching ceremony of uh, an Ainu dugout canoe. So, and the dugout tradition can also be found in Northern Honshu. In fact, I met in the early nineties, I met a professional builder of dugout boats. I mean, can you imagine flying into Tokyo, getting on a bullet train, getting out into the countryside and coming face to face with a craftsman who says, who builds dugout boats. I mean, that's part of the magic and amazing contrast in Japan. And I urge any of you, if you go to Japan, um, you absolutely have to go to rural Japan and get as far out in the countryside as you possibly can, because it's like another country. And it, it, it's possible to find amazing old traditions. Um, but dugouts and semi dugouts uh, can still be found uh, in fishing villages, not used anymore, probably sort of discarded on the, on the side, on the margins. But, but there was a, a tradition well into the 20th century, almost completely through the 20th century, of uh, dugouts and semi-dugout construction in the far north of Japan. Yeah. Just a little footnote to that. I know that um, the Ainu people, because they, they were truly northern people, they have cultural connections across um, even to Alaska, if you can believe this. Um, and so some of their marine vessels are skin on frame. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they've got kayaks and they are, there's a few examples in the Hakodate Museum in southern Hokkaido. Okay. And it, look, it's connected through, up through Russia and the Baidaka um, mm. kayak design. Anyway, just interesting that that kind of separation from the black current actually, because they're in a colder sea environment mm. and their tree, mm. their supply of timber is different. They had different yeah. marine vessels. Right. And in Okinawa, uh, my yeah. teacher, my teacher said, uh, um, uh, Sabani has nothing to do with Japan. Mm. Again, he was, uh, he was very typical of the native Okinawans. He did not consider himself Japanese. He yep. considered himself part of the Ryukyu kingdom. And he said the boat building influences in Okinawa are from Polynesia. Although the Okinawans never used outriggers. So that's fascinating. Um, but he was adamant that, that their cultural connections came from both China and Polynesia. He said Okinawans are a mix uh, culturally of Chinese and Polynesian. Yeah, so, and the yeah. connection there, I think, is Taiwan, because it's yeah. the Taiwanese who actually populated Polynesia and right down to New Zealand, actually, the Maoris as well have their DNA in Taiwanese people. And that went north into Okinawa. Right. They were Taiwan's great, not great, that far away yeah. from the southernmost Okinawan islands. Yeah. Incredible marine adventurers. Yeah. Similar, it reminded me, um, uh, reminded me, I went to the Orkney Isles in off the north coast of Scotland. And I made the mistake of referring to someone as a Scot. And they looked at me and said, I'm Orcadian. So, so island people. Well, you Australians are island people. <laughs> anyway. Um, we have a question from Simon Douglas. Is there a reason that the shear planks run out past the transom in several of the designs you have shown? Yeah, so there's two interesting. So you can see that in other parts of Asia, you see that in China and elsewhere in Asia. Um, I've gotten two answers for that. And if you ask a fisherman, they say, well, that's because it creates a, a well, an opening where, you know, if you have to lift your rudder or in a lot of small uh, powered boats, there's actually a universal joint on the propeller shaft. And as you come into shore, you can lift the propeller out of the water or right under the stern. And it provides a protected space for either the rudder or the propeller. That's a fisherman's answer. If you ask a boat builder, they say, well, of course you run the planks past the transom. If you cut the planks off right at the transom, 
the nail is liable to split them. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> so th those are those are the only two answers, and that that falls evenly between fishermen and uh, and mm. you remember the ship. So that ship is you know kind of an early inspiration for that hull style. Mm. You know, because those planks run past the transom and create this protected space mm. to protect the rudder. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions for Douglas? Sorry, I'll throw it back to the room. Nope, I think Chris might have a question, but he might be on mute. One second, Chris. Hang on, let me try and make sure I can unmute you. Now, am I, on, am I muted? Now we have you. Oh, you right. Yes, well, uh, I love dovetail keys, and I've cut some, and they take a long time to cut. Um, I was intrigued with the Sabani that you were involved with. How many keys were in I tried to count them on your, in your book, but I couldn't work it out. How many keys are in that uh, hull? Um, I think... Uh, so that when I showed that interior photo and that exterior photo, my memory serves me that was about 40 keys inside. So four, probably 40 keys outside. And then the bow and stern timbers would each be at least, well, probably 10 more keys, 40, 80, we're up to 100. And then the transoms, the, there's a bow transom and a stern transom uh 100 100 120 wow. maybe that's phenomenal yeah all an inch thick yeah all about an inch thick yeah, yeah. yeah. made of a hardwood a hardwood called chage which uh that's the okinawan name for it uh, very similar to maple i thought it was very in terms of color and density and everything about it it reminded me of what what we call hard maple um mm. and then of course using it with the soft cedar so that the magic of that that wedge system is absolutely that hardwood key is going into a softwood yeah yeah so yeah. in the west we're all we're typically dropping like a walnut dovetail key into a hardwood tabletop you can't use that method you're gonna you're gonna fit that that key precisely yes yes yeah yeah I so another, one more question. Sure. What was the hardest thing that you had to unlearn during your apprenticeships? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I think the hardest thing I, I okay, good. Good question. <laughs> um, when I look back at studying in Japan, I realize in retrospect, you know, I, because in, initially I was very confused by this teaching method. You know, these guys won't talk to me. They don't reveal things. If I look the other way, I'm at risk of missing something. Um, you know, they're telling me these stories about stealing secrets. I had to do that in one of my apprenticeships. My teacher forbade me to trace one of his patterns. So I came back in the shop later and I traced it. Yeah. I had, I had to do the exact same thing. Um, and, and, you know, from the outside, pretty brutal treatment. I mean, for the most part, my teachers were uh, fairly benign to me. In one case, one of my teachers was uh, very nasty to me. Um, uh, and, and, and when I look back on it, I realized the first lesson they were teaching me was humility. Mm. And that is the first lesson of the Japanese apprenticeship. Right. And I began to reflect on teaching workshops in my own culture. And this makes me very sad because when I teach in America, this would never happen in Australia, I'm sure. But when I teach in America, it's mostly men, unfortunately. And I find myself often battling my students' egos. Yes. 
They come into my workshop and they want to tell me how to do it. Yeah. Or they stand there and everything, every lesson I give, they say, I know that. I know that. I know that. Right? Yeah. Yes. And, and 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 I know what that feels like too. I mean, I know it it feels like to act out like that. Yeah. In fact, in my early apprenticeships, I realized how much I was trying to impress my teachers. And I would say, you know, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. And they would just say, keep sweeping. Yes. Get away. Yes. You know, and it was kind of funny. Um, uh, my early teachers, you know, they I would say to like, look, I'm an experienced boat builder. And they would say, yeah, you know how to build Western boats, but you don't know how to build Japanese boats. Yes. So you don't know anything. Yes. You know nothing. And I kept fighting. Like, don't tell me I know nothing, you know, in this sort of christian western self-centered <laughs> ego based yeah. worldview i'm trying to establish myself and my teachers just kept saying nope you don't know anything and it took me i'm sad to say how long it took me to realize wait a second listen to them and basically embrace ignorance yeah embrace knowing nothing and what i've come to realize is that that student you have who fights you who bucks you who tries to prove something to you is the person who will learn the least yeah yeah because they're closed off to it yeah that's, that's why women and, are the best students to have pardon me that's why women yeah. are the best students you'll ever have well because women you know women often have never been exposed to woodworking and so they come in with this openness. Yeah. Whereas men, sorry, I'm painting in broad brush strokes, and I know how sensitive you Australians must be. But men, you know, men come in with this thing like, I'm a man, I must know how to use this a priori, right? And, th and there's a defensiveness. One thing, one of the most amazing things has been having Japanese apprentices. And several times now I've had the, the, the great luxury of having Japanese apprentices. And that one, I showed you only one photo of my apprentice with the tub boats. He had done a six year roof tiling apprenticeship, moved to Sato Island where there was no work for roof tilers. So he did a six year carpentry apprenticeship. That man had had 12 years of apprentice training. And then he'd worked as, you know, a journeyman carpenter, and then he was chosen to be my apprentice. The first day on the job, I was asking him to do things, and I was, you know, saying, you know, Taka, go get that kudasai, kudasai, which is just please. That's just please, how you make a request in Japanese. And Taka took me aside, and he said, no kidding, he said to me, please do not use polite Japanese when you speak to me. <laughs> He was telling me, right. you must debase me yes. in the work outside the workshop. He said, that's fine. Yes. But yes. inside the workshop, you must not talk to me like that. You must right. not be polite to me. Yeah. Gee, we and must... I had some experiences with him that were positively magical. Several times on that project, I was looking at what we had to do. I had given Taka a job. I could hear him working and I said, Taka, would you get me? And he would be standing next to me holding the tool that I was right. about to ask for. Right. And what that is, those powers of observation, at no point was Taka ever working without one eye on me right. trying to predict my needs. Mm. And that is what I finally learned to embrace, which is don't fight back. Don't fight these guys. Be just sweep. Yeah. yeah. And sweeping is not a cast off job in the shop no. because when you're sweeping, you're watching. Yeah. And when you're sweeping, you're watching and you're learning. Yes. And when you're fetching, you're learning. And when you're sharpening, you're learning. And I eventually, I, you know, I feel like 
um, I feel like I'm a good apprentice. I know how to be an apprentice. So it's very interesting for me to teach now and to try to teach in this Japanese style, teach Westerners, because they're initially terrified of it. Absolutely yeah. terrified of it. They want reassurance. They want, you know, they want a step-by-step -step instruction. They don't want any mystery. They don't, and they don't want to fail. Yes. And, you know, it's been, it's been actually very sobering uh, teaching at American universities. Today's, today's young people are just, just this fear of failure is epidemic. And I have challenged all my college classes in our first discussion session, we broached this topic. And I've, and I've said to my college students, I've said, how many of you are willing to walk into a college lecture hall and in the middle of your professor's lecture, raise your hand and say, I don't know. And not a single one of my students is willing to do that. Yes. And, and yet, again, through my experiences in Japan, that has taught me that is the essence of learning, yeah. Yeah. opening yourself up and saying, I don't know. Great answer, oh. Doug, Douglas. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, this, is, this has been a lot of food for thought for me the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, a couple of questions here, Douglas, that are related to that, and I'm, I'll, I'll go through them in a bit of a funny order. But Chris just asked, when you stole the tracing, do you think that your teacher expected you to do that? Um, yeah, that was a really interesting moment. That was up north, the car, the boat with the beautiful carving. And, and the, uh, one of the patterns he had was for that curved stem. And I had this tracing paper. And so, you know, and we'd been working together for weeks. And, you know, I had my notebook and my camera and my video camera. And he saw me writing everything down. And I laid that pattern on my tracing paper and he exploded. He said, you can't trace that. And I said, Andosan, what, what are you saying? I said, the whole deal here was I was documenting your work. He said, that's fine. I said, I'm going to go back to America and I'm going to write up this research and do drawings of this boat. And he said, that's fine. And I said, so I need to trace this stem pattern. And he said, no. And we went and had the whole argument again. And the whole argument again, and the whole argument again. And I finally just said, Ando, what's the problem? And he was actually, he was actually my mean teacher. <laughs> mm. um, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I had some sympathy for that when I asked him one day, tell me about your apprenticeship. And I totally understood where he was coming from because he had a really brutal apprenticeship. But anyway, he looked at me and he said, you can go home to America and tell everybody everything, but the people in this village must never learn my secrets. And it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. He said, he basically said, go tell the whole world, but not this village. And I, I you know, I, I actually, I said to him, Ando, you went out of business 22 years ago. My research grant brought him out of retirement. I said, this is the first boat you've built in 22 years. There's no more, there's, there, there, you know, it's over. But he could not let go of that. That could, the, his, so anyway, so the, the kabuki of it was, he made that statement and I said, I said, okay, okay, Ando, I won't tell anybody in the village. And then he said, good sweep up the shop, lock the door, see you in the morning. And he walked out. <laughs> and I traced it. And he had, I mean, he's no fool. Mm -hmm. And what I like that, if you know Japanese culture, Japanese culture is very much about form, kabuki. And I feel like that moment was Ando played, he played his role and I played mine mm. and we didn't have to, we didn't do it in front of each other. I mm. think that's the mistake I made. Mm. I was doing it in front of him and that was too much for him. 
and so that that was our interaction yeah it was really it was really mm. pretty fascinating yeah there's another question um from dale and Dale, we'll get to the timber one in a bit but this is related and you've sort of answered in a way but if masters are not forthcoming with the teaching information what's the incentive from the master's perspective in teaching you so what are the, the yeah getting from if, teaching you? if I, I like to say i came to japan at the exactly the right time if i came in 1990 my teachers were all in their 70s and 80s when i worked with them if i had come 10 or 20 years earlier they would have thrown me out of their workshops i know it um what happened was for all my teachers they reached a point where they realized wait a second i'm a fourth generation boat builder and i'm the last one i've never had an apprentice and I could feel that from in different ways. I felt that from really all my teachers that I was their last chance. And just a couple of years ago, actually, I met a boat builder, um, 85. Well, he was 85 then he's 87 or eight now. And I was introduced to him. He's outside of Hiroshima, still active. Um, and he was showing me around the shop and I was asking questions and he was showing me drawings and he paused in the middle of our conversation. And he said to me, you know, if you'd walked in here 10 years ago, I would have thrown you out. I wouldn't have shown you anything. And then, and I, it was kind of a shocking statement. And then he said to me, but now it's time to document me. And he looked at me and he said, he said, I'm starting, I start building a 35 foot boat in the spring. You're going to be here. And, and unfortunately, he assumed I lived in Japan. And I said, I, I won't be here in the spring. I'm sorry. And he was really crestfallen. Mm -hmm. But I've, I, my wife has witnessed this. Um, in my travels, of course, I, in the course of my years, I always look for boat builders and interview boat, you know, interview, photograph their work. So I've met over 50 boat builders, studied with nine. And my wife has seen this over and over again. 20 minutes after walking into a boat shop, a perfect stranger, a boat builder will look at me and say, you have to come back because I have to teach you. And I mean, you know, the hardest part of this is raising the funding to do it. So um, that hasn't been possible. So that's, that's what that's about. And the other, the other absolute taboo that I broke is I have more than one teacher. And in Japanese crafts, that is considered unthinkable. You remain loyal to your master for, for your master's entire lifetime. In fact, you cannot refer to yourself as a master until your master dies. So you meet mature craftsmen in their 50s and 60s who say, no, 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 don't call me master. You know, when my master's 90, he's still alive. Um, and that was... That ability to have more than one teacher is solely because I'm a foreigner. And it was an unsettling thing for some of my teachers. And in fact, my two teachers on Tokyo Bay had been competitors. And that was a very difficult thing for both of them that I studied with the other. But we worked that out. I tell that story in my book. Um, they worked it out. <laughs> and uh, um, but as a foreigner, like a lot of things with Japanese culture, Japanese consider their culture inaccessible to non-Japanese. And so you're forgiven as an Australian or an American or anybody uh, for breaking the rules. And I, that's a major rule I broke, but people let me break it. I, I, I honestly don't believe a, an ethnic Japanese could have done what I've done. I just, I think a, a Japanese master would have met a Japanese budding apprentice who said, I've studied with three other boat builders. And they would have said, get out of here. Cause I've heard, I've heard stories from craftspeople of trying, you know, to do that. And you see that in Aikido, apparently in Aikido, they're all obsessed with what line of Aikido you've studied and you can't enter the dojo of a competing line of Aikido. I've heard that over and over again. So even in the martial arts, there's, there's that fealty to a single line or a single master. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, also in the chat, um, Dale brought up the leveling mechanisms, um, shaming of the meat. It's referred to in different groups around the world in terms of making sure that people learning enter on or, you know, are brought down a lower level or to a level that they can be worked with at. Yeah. Uh, and Jake also said that he was apprenticing as a tattooist. Mm. And it, there's an old school element to that craft where observation is a key element of learning. Yeah. Um, but also a very interesting question about timber. Is it mm. difficult sourcing Japanese cedar in the US and Australia? And if so, what local wood might be suitable? Well, so I live in the northeast of the US and what I've got to match if I'm going to build a Japanese boat is what can I get in those wide planks, long lengths. So in the university classes, you saw pictures of that's Eastern white pine. So it's not a bad wood for boat building, but it's certainly not considered a great boat building wood, but I can get even at, um, you know, even at, a, if I go to an independent sawmill and bring a log, I could get whatever I want, but, uh, you know, the pines grow quite big and with a little sourcing, I can get the sizes equivalent or nearly equivalent to what I've worked with in Japan. If I were in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., Western red cedar would be pretty similar to Japanese cedar and also available in enormous, but at, at incredible expense, just mind boggling expense. I taught that workshop. I've also developed a one week Japanese boat building workshop, eight hours a day, five days. And I'm working with Mitch on trying to come over to Australia in the future and teach that workshop where we build the 21 foot river boat you saw. And um, I taught it in the Pacific Northwest and we use Ponderosa pine, which again is big, big trees and, and relatively inexpensive. Um, if I were gonna build a nice Japanese boat here in New England or the Northeast, um, I might consider Southern Cypress, which is a beautiful, beautiful boat building wood that's from the mid-Atlantic, Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. Uh, it's a swamp wood, but it's a beautiful boat building wood that was used on the Gulf Coast of the U.S. And that you can get in phenomenal sizes. Um, Australia, Mitch, Mitch is the guy to answer that. You do not want to build the boat out, one of these boats out of eucalyptus. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know um, the best sort of suggestion. I mean, and again, getting stuff in sort of such wide boards would be the difficult thing. Um, I think cedars are probably the closest we can get, um, but it'll be a different quality of cedar to what would be found in Japan, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we're, look, we're thinking and, and playing with the idea of trying to get some, some Japanese timber to Australia um, for a few of our own projects. Um, it's a fairly large scale, difficult project though. If anyone is interested in Japanese timber, let me know because we'll certainly need some help to make that happen. Um, so, and, and if we can get Douglas to Australia, we'd really, really like to be able to try and match some Japanese cedar to those projects. But there's a lot of um, lines to draw between dots there still. Yeah. Um, we've just clocked past the midday here in Australia and um, just past fairly late at night uh, for you, Douglas. Um, so guys, we might end it there if that's okay. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Um, Jake would like some mountain cherry wood blocks. All right, Jake, we'll be in touch. We'll uh, try and figure something out. Um, so Douglas, thank you very, very much for sure. presenting for us today. It's been fascinating for me and I'm sure for everyone who's been able to be a part of it. And I just wanna say, well, you'll all get an email from me via Mitch and feel free to reach out to me. You'll see my social media. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to send the email I send you is going to be crammed full of stuff. Um, so work through it. But I think you'll find everybody will find something of interest. Look for those videos of the nail, uh, rhythmic nail uh, tapping and start practicing. 
and uh, lick your nails, get your nails nice and rusty and then lick them. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to answer any follow-ups and I hope I hope when the world isn't upside down anymore, uh, I can see some meet some of you folks in person and do a workshop or a demonstration in Australia. It's been a long time since I was there. Mm. Yeah, well, um, and thank you very much, Douglas, again. And thank yep. you for everyone for being a part of it. This is the first Zoom seminar we've run, and it's been an absolute pleasure to run it with somebody so across such a fascinating subject. Um, so thank you again, Douglas. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and uh, look forward to catching you all around the traps. I'll send out Douglas information and this recording as well for you to uh, go back over. Great. Thanks, Mitch. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful Saturday and <laughs> I'll catch you all soon. Good. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Bye. Oh, thank you, Luke. Cheers.